All right. Let's go ahead and have a prayer and uh, before we begin. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, your word. We thank you for the Psalms that we read, Father, specifically. And we, we thank you for uh, the inspiration that they give us. Lord, we pray that you would be with us as we study your word today. Help us, Lord, to uh, understand it. Help us, Father, to uh, be able to be inspired by it, Lord. And I just pray you would bless our class today. Help us all to engage our thoughts and our minds, to participate, and to, uh, to think about it, to meditate on your word, Lord. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, hey, Chip. Hey. So let's go ahead and turn to Psalm 8, please. If you haven't already done that, Psalm 8. This will be our selected psalm for today. And um, let's go ahead and read this. Um, psalm 8. For the director of music, according uh, to Geteth, a psalm of David. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hand. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Should we break out in song right now? Amen. Uh, actually, I was going to suggest something like that. You know, really? It is, and it is a song. There's, there's, there's a song that starts out with the first verse. Uh, oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. Um, that is a song that we sing. And, of course, this was a song. We don't know the tune that they sang it to, but this was a song. Uh, all of these were songs. It was a songbook. You know, I used to um, have a dim view of poetry. Um, you might say, why? Well, when I was in my school days, I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I imagined poetry was um, somebody's uh, idea. They would think of some idea, noble as it was or ignoble, whatever it may be, and then they would build a hedge around the idea so that you could not understand what he was talking about. And that was my idea of poetry. I thought, well, what's the deal? Why don't they just come out and tell us, you know? And of course, later on, I, I, I got a more mature view of it and understood that it's not so much a hedge around an idea, but an idea itself that's expressed in word pictures. Um, and that's more of the thing. And you know how people say a picture is worth a thousand words. And so it, it, um, it, to me, it's something that if you allow it, it will touch your soul. It's something that if you, if you look into it, and especially the Psalms, it will touch your soul and it will help inspire you. Uh, and that's kind of where, as we study the Psalms, I, I'm trying to hopefully get us to. Now, and as we get in class like this, we discuss it almost like it's prose and it's not. Um, and so that's why I would suggest that there is a use for the Psalm other than just having a class and talking about it. And the use for that is for us getting off by ourselves sometime and actually just reading it and meditating on it ourselves and see how it applies to our own lives and, and just help it to see and basically what I said, let it touch your soul. And that is, that's what it was designed to do. Um, and so I just, in, in matter of, of introduction, I just want to kind of bring that out there. Again. Um, Oh, Lord, our Lord. Now, um, I'm going to bring this up again because I, I never really noticed this. I've read this psalm many times, but I've never really noticed this until I've tried to teach it. And that is the first four words. It says, oh, Lord, our Lord. Do you notice something there? The first Lord is all caps. All caps. The second Lord is not. And so basically what it's saying is, 
Um, oh, Yahweh, our Lord, is what it's saying. It's saying it's the proper name for God in Hebrew. And then it's saying that you are our master. That's what it's saying. It's, that, that's kind of, the second word is kind of like meaning master. And the first word is the proper name for God. Um, now, if you have the ASV, most of you don't anymore, but in more conservative churches of Christ, you'll probably find people who use the ASV a lot. It will use a different word there at the beginning. It will say, oh, Jehovah, our God. Um, and that is basically a, 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 transliter a, a different transliteration of Yahweh. Um, and it's it's kind of like a, um, a Latin versus Greek or something along those lines, but it's a different. And most scholars agree that it's probably not the best transliteration of it. But um, we're not going to have a big discussion of that right now. The point is that the first word is the proper name for God in Hebrew. Um, now, you might say, why don't they actually put that there instead of Lord? And I think the reason is the translators recognized that the Hebrews very rarely actually used the word Yahweh. Uh, if, if you look at the Hebrew, it doesn't have any vowels in it. The ah and the, the, the a sound is added in so you can actually pronounce it. It's, it's um, uh, transliterated be why, uh, why, hold on. I'm trying to think of it now. Um, uh, y W uh, Y H Y W Y H, uh, and it, it has no vowel in there. And it was meant it was meant to be that way because they said, well, if we spell it that way, people will be less likely to say it, and, and that's it. And they would. We have to actually add the vowels to do that. And I was thinking about this. Um, you might say, how come you don't see it very often in the Bible? I was looking at one translation that actually does put in Y, y A W H Y A W. It spells it out with the vowels in there uh, added. Um, and instead of capital, all caps, Lord. But um, you see the Hebrews, they're monotheistic. We only have, we only have one God. And so the name was not as important. You could say God and you knew who you were talking about, right? You, you weren't talking about a sun god and a moon god and a, and a god of the sea and a god of whatever else, you know. There was no, you didn't need to do that. So anyway, uh, let's move on. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Some translations say excellent. King James says excellent. Magnificent is another one. Does anyone have any others in theirs? would like to add in. Is that about it? How majestic? I like majestic. Um, it is uh, it is an adoration, uh, and it's saying in, in all the earth. It's not like just for us. It's everywhere. He is God everywhere. He is majestic everywhere in all the earth. Um, and then he goes beyond the earth in the next phrase, and it says, "You have set your glory where." Above the, heavens. Above the heavens. Now think about that for just a second. When you think about up, you think of the heavens, right? That's the heavens. Um, this is whatever is up there. Above that is God. It's above that. God is greater than the heavens. He is greater than the universe. He is greater than all of this. And that's what it's 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 getting at. It says, "You have set your glory above the heavens." Um, a a. a one commentator, um, a guy named Cloer, wrote a commentary on this. He's actually a uh, professor, Harding, wrote this. He said, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to translate. And I can understand that. A lot of poetry probably is. He says, it's, it says something to the effect of he has put glory in the heavens by his creation of them. Thus, as they fulfill their various purposes, they reflect the wondrous nobility, grandeur, and magnificence of the hand that made them. And I think that's, that's, that's a good uh, interpretation of that. Um, we, we look, and, 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 and the Apostle Paul um, has the same view in Romans. He says, we know that there is a God by what has been made. And we can see. Um, now, I can picture this. This is a Psalm of David. 
And what did David do before he was king or before he was a warrior? What did he do before he defeated Goliath? What, what was his occupation? Shepherd. He was a shepherd. Now, I can imagine taking care of those sheep sometimes at nighttime. And they didn't have the street lights that we have out there, probably. Matter of fact, at some point, the fire burned out, and it was all darkness except for what? Stars. I mean, that's what he saw. Nancy and I remember quite vividly a trip that we took about, about 2016. Pat Rowe uh, was gracious enough to let us stay in his cabin out there in Montana. And we went out there and it was in the foothills of the mountains. And one particular day, um, I was, uh, I don't, for, for some reason I couldn't sleep. So I walked out on the porch and I didn't have my glasses on, but I looked up and I said, goodness. And then I put my glasses on and I'm telling you, they don't call it big sky country for nothing. I mean, I, I saw the sky like I'd never seen it before. And I've been camping before, but I think we were just through more of the atmosphere up, up higher or something. But I mean, it looked like, it looked like a felt with diamonds all over it. I mean, just scattered billions of them. Uh, am I right, babe? I mean, I, I had to get her up to see it the next day. So not at the right, not at that time, but I told her about it and it just, uh, it was magnificent. It was just glorious. Uh, and I, re I remember it to this day. I can imagine David have seen something like that and, and, and inspired him to write this. So notice the sun's not mentioned in this song. This is, this is an evening experience. Okay. Um, it says, you have set your glory above the heavens from the lips of children and infants. You have ordained praise because of your enemies dishonest the foe and the avenger. Okay, from the lips of infants, or, or children and infants, you have ordained praise. Um, what, what does this mean? What's the significance of, of uh, children here? What's the significance of children? Now, let's think about this for a moment. You got to put your thinking cap on and kind of give me a chance to drink my tea here. <laughs> What's the significance of children? They don't have an agenda. Okay. They, they have an, uh, Some they, they, they do have, yeah, you're correct. The natural outpouring from them. It says, because of your enemies in the silent and to silence the foe and the avenger. So the praise coming from them is for somebody who doesn't like God to hear. Yeah. You know, there is, um, there's all kinds of Christian apologists, very good ones. Uh, the William, Lane, William Lane Craig is a very good Christian apologist. He talks, he's a philosopher that talks about how, you know, really in philosophy, there, it doesn't make sense without God. Um, and, and he does it very well. He debates atheists and he does all kinds of things. There's many of them out there that do, that, uh, do this. And he's very, very astute, er, erudite, I think is the word for it. He's very, he's smart, okay? <laughs> he's smart. And he displays his knowledge of God in, in scholarly terms. And he writes books and he gets in front of atheists and he talks to them and, and you know, helps, helps people who are watching with an open mind see that God really is real and everything like that. But this is saying you really don't have to have somebody like that. Children will do it just fine. And they will. Children have a natural belief in God. They really do. You don't really have to convince them about God. You don't have to do all that. Now, I believe in preparing them for confronting uh, this because the children grow up. And then all of a sudden other ideas come in and, and try to compete against that. And we have to prepare them for that. But as they're children, you know, I think of, of scenes. Uh, I remember Jim Beasley. He was telling me about his daughter, Lauren, when she was growing up. She was probably five years old. And they, uh, I think Marjorie was away, and, and they, they, she had, he was taking care of, of Lauren. And, and um, they sat down to eat, and she just st suddenly started crying. And he thought, what's wrong? And through her tears, she said, Daddy, we didn't pray. You know? And, and uh, the other day, Nancy and I were in Dairy Queen with uh, 
with, with uh, well, our niece and, and her daughter, and her daughter's two years old. And um, we, we sat down to pray, but um, in, in the past, we hold, held hands, you know, and when we pray. And that's how she knew that's how you pray. You hold hands when you pray. We didn't hold hands this time. Oh, my goodness. What did she yell out? Nene. Nene, you know. <laughs> it was, she held her hand out like that, you know. She had to do it right. Uh, children are that way. I, I, my nieces and nephews, I, I, I just stories about this over and over again about how they're how they love God and they they wanted to serve Him and, and everything like that. And, and I'm sure I'm sure you see some of that too. I, I mean, a lot of that I imagine as director of the of the children's ministry and everything. But it just uh, over and again. Um, from the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. There's just something about children that, that help us to see God. And, um, and, and if you look now, um, this, I think, speaks directly to the part about your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger um, in Matthew chapter 21. Let's turn over there if you have your Bible. Matthew chapter 21, and let's look uh, around verse a little before verse 16, if we can do that. Let me mark my spot here. Um, Matthew 21, um, verse, let's start verse 12. Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and uh, the benches of those selling doves. Uh, it is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David. Now, the son of David, that was a messianic term, okay? The Messiah was to be called the son of, was called the son of David. They were indignant. That is the teachers of the law were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. And Jesus, without us, without skipping a beat, what does he say? Yes, he replied. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You have ordained praise. That's it. What was he saying there? What is he saying? Look at the psalm. Who is it talking? Who is the you there? Who is the you from the lips of children and infants? You have ordained praise. Who is the you? Oh, Lord, uh, Yahweh. Yahweh, our Lord, is the you. Jesus is, uh, Jesus is making a statement here. He throws this right back in their face without even skipping a beat and says, haven't you read? I mean, and, and he left them holding their scrolls and scratching their heads. Silence the foe and the avenger. The children did that. And Jesus followed it up with the verse. Um, so, hmm, you know, there's some other there's some other thoughts in this as well. Um, if you look at the uh, rescue of the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt. Uh, Moses was sent from the time he was an infant. He was a baby. He was put in the basket and put through the water. And, um, and of course, Jesus came as a, as a baby, right? Um, so Anyway, this is um, it all, it's some symbolism here that some people have pointed out, and I think it's le legitimate. Um, and this is to silence the foe and the avenger, the enemies of God. Um, <clears throat> so God has even used children to shut the mouths of his critics. Uh, then we see verse 3. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, uh, this universe is huge. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't bring up any statistics, okay? I think we've heard statistics before. Um, it would take, 
you know, to get to the nearest star, you'd have to travel at light speed for, you know, quite a number of years, uh, more, more years than what we have probably uh, to live. And so it's just, if, if, uh, if we could ever travel at light speed, which we can't. Um, and so it's just, the universe is huge. And we, how do we compare with the universe? How do we compare with the size of the universe? Insignificant. Grain of sand? Yeah, tiny. That, even that, you know? <clears throat> I mean, uh, it's, it's, we are, by all accounts, insignificant regarding the universe. I mean, it should be a humbling experience to look up and see what's out there and realize that you're only seeing a, a, a tiny, tiny portion of what's there. You're only seeing a tiny portion of it. Um, says here, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, and God made it with his fingers, you know, say, of course, this is, this is symbolism, okay? Uh, we don't know that God has fingers, but that's, a, that's symbolic, okay? Uh, which you have set in place. What is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Of course, the son of man here, it's, it's not speaking of a messianic son of man, it's speaking of just another name for humans, humankind. Uh, what is mankind that you are mindful of him? Um, another translation says human beings that you care for him. Um, the, um, it, it is, these Psalms ask questions that they don't answer. This is a question that it purposely does not answer. It leaves it for us to meditate on and to think about. And we should. We absolutely should think about what, why, is, why does God, why does God love me? That's a legitimate question. The psalmist asked it. Why does, you know, what is man that you care about him? And then he says, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You know, there's a, there's a, um, there's a song that um, I, I question the theology of, just one word. They changed, actually most song books changed the wording of it uh, to change. It's, alas, and did my savior bleed, and did my sovereign die. And how's the rest of it go? Or is it you but your work? Secret? Well, and, 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 for such a worm as I. Yeah, most songbooks have changed that for such a one as I. And, and the thing is this, um, God has made us above the worms, okay? He has made us above the worms. He has made us above the thing. And, and, and you know, despite, I understand the point that the writer of that song was saying, and that's the fact we're sinners, and we are. But that's not a good comparison because God has given us something that is different than the animals. Um, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. Matter of fact, we are just a little lower than the angels. And I think some translations actually say a little lower than God himself is what I, I think some of the translations say. What does yours say there, uh, Chip? What do you have? Heavenly beings. Heavenly beings. A footnote that says, or than God. <clears throat> exactly, and some choose that one instead. It's it's a hard one to translate, but the, the, the idea is still the same. We God has made us uh, as pretty high on the totem pole. You know, He put us there, and we think, why did He do that? But He did, and so we need to recognize that, um, and crown Him with glory and honor. Um, so first of all, I, I guess to back up just a little bit before we go on, this Psalm answers two questions. Who is God and who am I? Who is God and who am I? And we need to answer that in that order because who am I is all wrapped up in the first question. Um, and as, as we look up and we see the sky and all of that, we need to have some humility about it. And this question is asked in humility. What is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You know, I think of another verse, and I've read this in, in here in this, uh, I think, last week. But I'm going to read it again. It's another psalm, Psalm 103. I'm not going to read the whole thing. One verse says, as for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. 
You ever walked through a cemetery? You ever seen the, the, the gravestones? Some of them, especially at the Tyson Cemetery, Nancy's family has its own cemetery. It's up on the north side of town. And I walked through that, been through it many times. And uh, there's some from the 1700s back there um, and early 1800s. And I'm like, who are these people? And eventually there's some that we just don't know. We don't know who they were. We don't know anything about them. And it's gonna be that way with us too, by the way. There's where someone's gonna walk by our tombstone one day and say, I wonder who this person was. And they're not gonna know. And then eventually that tombstone will probably grind down to nothing. And then there will be nothing there. And that's just the way it is. That's the way things are. But God will remember us. Because it says here, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. That same verse in, uh, that I just read about the, our days are like grass, it says, but as far, uh, as far as the east is from the west, God remembers those who love him. And so, and I, no, it says, I'm sorry. It says from everlasting to everlasting, God remembers those who love him. That's the difference. From everlasting to everlasting. And so, um, we need to, to, I mean, this is, this is an amazing thought and it's hard to bring out in a class like this. This is one of those thoughts that you need to dwell on in the middle of the night and think about, you know, it's, uh, it's just kind of something like that. But um, it says you made him ruler over the works of your hands and you put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds, all the beasts in the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim in the paths of the sea. Um, you know, God gave us special attention. I want us to look, and this is one of the most important verses in the Bible. It's profound. It's more profound than we realize. Uh, we read it since we were probably little. And it's in Genesis chapter 2. And actually in chapter 1. And it's at the end of creation. Verse 27. Well, actually, we'll start in verse 26. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock and over all the earth and over all creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them in his own image. That's a powerful verse. You know, people say, well, the Bible is nothing but a, a you know, it's, it's a full of a patriarchal, a patriarchal hierarchy that's always against women, you know, that kind of thing. That's ridiculous. Um, it says male and female, he created them, created them in his own, what? Image. In his own image. Um, you didn't tell that about any of the other, what? Creatures. Creatures. No. We're the only ones that got that. We're made in the image of God. We're going to spend just a few minutes. Let's, let me just throw that out there. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? Now, I'll tell you before we throw that out, much ink has been spilled over this question. But I think we, it's worth examining. Does anybody want to, uh, you know, just let's go ahead and throw that out here. We've got some time. What, is, uh, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? <clears throat> well, we're told elsewhere that we were created for good works. I think that's part of it. We were created to be good and do good according to God's definition, which is all wrapped up in love. <laughs> okay. All right. And I think that's also why, why Satan attacked the way he did. <clears throat> do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Well, when he introduced sin, sin prevents us from being the natural person that we were created to be. Mm, hinders that, yeah. Uh, the world uses natural. We think of the word, the natural man, and, all, and the scripture does too, as evil or tending toward evil. Mm -hmm. But if you start here, the way we were designed and created naturally. Originally. 
natural would be something the, the polar opposite, 180 degrees away from that. Yeah. And so <clears throat> we were created in his image to do good works, which would be expressing his love. Okay. And those are broad brush strokes. I mean, you can put a lot of details on that. Okay. All right. What else? Anyone else have any thought on what it means to be the image of God? Go ahead, Jim. I, I think of the Trinity. They, they designed man and woman just like they wanted them to be. And they weren't a man, a woman, and let's go out and you guys do your own thing. They wanted unity. They wanted some cohesion to what's going on. And that came out very strong at the Tower of Babel that God realized, whoa, wait a minute. If they really got unified, uh, there's nothing they cannot do. I better scatter them a little bit. But I think originally that was his design. He wanted us to all be one in common with one another, just like we are in a family. You're, you're very close to your family. You're very attached to them. Even though you live separate lives, you're still family. And uh, I think that's what they had in mind as well. Okay. Anybody else? Could it be that we were created to be sovereign? We were created to be rulers, benevolent rulers and leaders. Of, of what's on the planet. He does mention that, absolutely. He says, in the, in the psalm, it made him ruler over the works of your hands. And so, yeah, I, I'm not going to argue with you on that. That's. Uh, I don't think we think of ourselves that way because it's kind of scary to think that we, we should be in charge and people don't like that idea. It's scary for the same reason that he said, because we have sinned. Because we live in a fallen world now, and the 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 the, the original intention uh, we have we have thwarted the original intention from free because of the free choice God has given us, and we chose wrong. But yes, yes. I I, I think that uh, you know he, he gave us a soul, and, and with that soul we have the ability to be like him. Okay, we it, it's a term, The soul is eternal. The soul is eternal, is eternal. Yeah, and so, yes, absolutely. Um, and in Psalm, Psalm 23, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So, yes, very good. Um, I think, go ahead, brother. Just a side note, since you're there, I always, I've always found it interesting that, or maybe even overlooked, that there was a conversation that went on before the statement, let there be light, was made. That this, that this was planned, you know. Um, you know you, you've heard it taught or you've heard it talked about that, you know, Jesus was the reaction to fix creation. And, and we know that's not true. God knew that what Satan was going to do. And he planned ahead of time. You know, Jesus said, I'll die on the cross before God said, let there be light. I go along with that. I don't, it wasn't an afterthought. No. This is not an afterthought at all. Um, you know, the the, the uh, prophecy that I will bruise your head and, and he, or he will bruise your heel and I will bruise your head, you know, that one. That was there from the beginning. And uh, but yeah, I think even before that, you know, it was, it was no. Um, I think of our intellect. You know, I mean, we have, as someone can say, well, you know, dolphins are smart. Well, I haven't seen many dolphins build hospitals or, you know, uh, no, it's not that way. I mean, yeah, you can train a dolphin, you can train a monkey, but you, you know, human, we, we come up with, with art. We come up with beauty. We come up with, with, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's intellect that God has given us that has, he has, he has not given the others. He's not given the animals. Uh, I think that's part of it as well. But, you know, in, in addition to that, it's interesting, though, because while sometimes we think of the image of God as, as you know, us Christians and people who are believers and things like that, you know, ask anybody, though, and everybody knows right from wrong, good from evil. So everybody has that Idea. ability and that moral sense, moral sense that yeah. God gave everyone. Yeah. And I think sometimes we lose focus or, or people lose focus on that 
up and say God doesn't exist. Oh yeah. That if you say God doesn't exist, you better be prepared for the, for the repercussions of that because there are lots of them and, and people don't, atheists who say that don't un, really understand the implications of that. Or even just that I don't believe in God. Yeah. He might yeah. be there, but I don't believe in it. But yeah. we all have that same moral compass, but we, um, God has made us special and we should understand that. Um, for whatever reason, the Psalm does not answer. It, it asks the question for us to ponder, but God has made us special. We need to smile at that and recognize that it's true. Um, there's a story I, I was, it's not a story, I mean, this is a life experience. Uh, many years ago before I married Nancy, I was in the singles ministry here and we went on a trip. <clears throat> I think we went to Itchituffee Springs or something and I was driving the church van. It was very similar to the church van we have now, it looks like anyway, but I was driving the church van and coming back and I went over a hill and there full of bus van full of people full of, full of church members singles come going to the thing and we're coming back and they're walking in front of me uh in front of the highway was a mama duck and about six or seven ducklings just walking them down the road. And of course, I'm an animal lover. You know, I love animals and I love, you know, I'm uh, Nancy and I are both. Um, that day I ran over every single one of those because I was not gonna swerve that van. It was a theological decision because the people that I was carrying were more valuable than the ducks were. That's the reason. See, that's how that works. And, um, you know, as much as I hated to do that, broke my heart, but I was going to do it because God said an order of things. And that's the order of things. It's the way it is. And um, so anyway, the, <clears throat> um, let's see, where are we here? Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. He closes it out with that. And, um, that is kind of like the way the poetry works. It kind of is a parallelism and it's kind of bookends. He closes it out. So let's go ahead. We have about five minutes for the, the final bell rings. So let's go ahead and talk about anything else that we, that, that comes out to you in this. Is any, uh, anything that we uh, talked about? I'm going to throw it open for discussion. So any points that, uh, that you would like to, to bring out that uh, we, didn't cover or did cover that you'd like to highlight or something like that. No? Wow. Okay. I'd like to point out one thing that, and I think we all know it, but sometimes we forget when you look at verse six and it talks about how God made us the ruler and put everything under, you know, we have a great responsibility here on earth. Yeah. Uh, that he gave us and, and we are the caretakers of a lot of his creation yeah. and then we also have a work to go out and spread the good news of him to other people so i think we we always need to remember that he gave us great responsibilities the, the psalm itself is worth declaring okay um you know we uh we learn more and, and i speak i meant to mention this earlier thank you for for saying that um, I learn more teaching than not teaching. Okay. I learn more, uh, when I'm teaching this class, I learn more of the Bible than I do otherwise because I have to prepare for it. And so I would encourage you, you may not be teaching a class, but you're teaching somebody. You're teaching somebody somewhere. You're influencing your neighbor, your influence. You know, it's a good idea when you, share with somebody a Bible verse of what it meant to you, you're learning and it blesses you. Um, I, I get with um, a guy named uh, Josh Hogmeyer every Thursday. He's uh, someone that I baptized a couple years ago and we still get together to study the Bible. And I really look forward to those times because I learn, uh, I still learn from it, you know, cause we, we sit and we do it on zoom, but uh, I still learn from it. And so, and it may not have to be on Zoom, but can it be on wherever else? Um, you know, there's a lot of people, most of us in here have been Christians for a long time. 
You know, I don't see any visitors in here where most of us have probably been Christians for a long time. Okay, maybe, but, but anyway, yeah, this, okay, uh, most, let me scratch the word visitor. Most of us have been Christians for a long time, okay, and um, if not all, and we hear these things, and I don't think there's anything we probably disagreed with in the lesson today. If you, if you did, you should raise your hand to say something, but um, we need to share this, if not with the children, with other people. Uh, this needs to be shared. This needs to be discussed, you know, what we, what we talk about uh, in class. Um, all right, let me see if I had anything else here. We may just dis dismiss early today. Um, oh, self-esteem, that's where I am. Many, many times you hear the word self-esteem. Okay, uh, it comes up a lot in school, it comes up a lot. Um, what is the source of our self-esteem? Okay, this was not intended to be a hard question. Ourself? No. <laughs> he's, he's <laughs> our parents. Parents. No. The, uh, the value that we have comes from God. And that's what we need to teach. When people try to teach self-esteem without God, then it's like, where, where, do you, where does value come from? You end up with the question, you know, where am I in this universe? Okay, self-esteem comes from God. And that's the, uh, you know, that's the important thing. Um, without God, the value, how are you going to establish our value without God? How is that going to happen? Well, it's not. Uh, otherwise, we're just so many molecules in the universe um, that they're going to disappear very soon. But if we have a soul made in the image of God, a spirit that's going to last forever, then there's a difference there. That's, that's different. And that's how we need to teach value. Okay? That's how we need to understand it ourselves and teach it to the, the other one, the little ones. Uh, value comes from God because he values us. All right, let's close out with prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, your word. We thank you for the value that you have given us. We pray that you would help us, Lord, to uh, latch onto that and understand it, Father. Help us, even though we don't know why, but we thank you for it, and we are, we are thankful. Help us, Lord, to show our gratitude each day. Help us to teach others about you and that your greatness and your glory and your majesty, and help us, Lord, ourselves to, to uh, show that glory in the way we live, in the words that we say, in the thoughts that we think. And Father, we pray that you would help us to um, uh, appreciate the value that you have given us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Uh, early today. Oh, I know. I'm doing.